So um, I've got the delightful part where um, I get to say how hard all of this stuff is. Um, so in other words, discuss a little bit around the challenges which, which we find year in, year out, generation over generation, um, where, where we haven't quite got to the sorts of rural coverage that we would really like. And so I thought it'd be worth um, taking the time to take you through, you know, a lot of people in the audience are either from service provider or have been in the service provider. So this will not be news to you, but um, for some of the others in the audience, um, it's probably worthwhile just explaining a little bit about, you know, why is this so, so damn difficult? It really comes down to just one thing, and that is money. And it's, you know, specifically, it's around, uh, if we kind of look at where money is spent um, in the city, for, every, for every, every dollar you pay or every pound you put down on investment in infrastructure in the city, you get a pretty good rate of return. Um, and in suburban, not so much, but, you know, there's fixed wireless access and there's other, there's, other uh, there's decent rates of return in suburban. But in rural, it's always been a challenge and it still is a challenge. For the investment that you make, for every penny or pound you put down, the return isn't great and the more remote and the more rural it is, the less likely you're going to get a return. And so, you know, that, that leads to what, you know, what I tend to call um, unnatural acts. And, um, and so service providers, you know, they, they would love to provide 100% um, geographic coverage. That, that would be fantastic. It would resolve an awful lot of the issues that we tend to see here on the right-hand side now. So delivering on core poor customer experience is not something that customer services teams and service providers want to take calls on. Um, taking subsidies, frankly, from, from government um, is not necessarily what a service provider is in business to do. And, you know, frankly, I'm pretty sure a lot of service providers would sit there and say, I would rather not take them subsidies. I would rather not have all these obligations on the licenses that I have to, that I, auction, that I buy from auction. Um, but nevertheless, that they take them and, and, and they have to in some, in some cases because, you know, that's Ofcom particularly now are, are looking at this and saying, this is the problem we need to resolve. The competition problem is solved. You know, it, we're still watching it carefully, but we, we need to twist our experience a little bit and, and kind of address some of these kind of rural areas. Um, so it's what I call kind of an un, unnatural act. You know, you, you take the money um, and you'll, you'll spend it, but, you know, unless it's something... It's, I, I always think about, you know, when my mother would ask me to do something versus something I wanted to do. If my mum asked me to do it or made me do it, I would kind of get it done, but would it stay done? Would I do a great job? Maybe not. But if it's something I want to do, then, you know, and, and typically, you know, in, in business, if you want to do something, it's because there's a revenue and there's a return there, then you're going to do it. And so, you know, as, as the two speakers before me have already said, um, you know, that's the way to, to resolve this conundrum. It's try and find enough cases um, to, to make it something that a service provider wants to do. And so um, we, we use the term not spot in this project quite a lot. And, um, you know, that immediately prompts the question, what's the definition? What's the specific definition of a not spot? Is it, is it where no operator is? Is it where only two of the four? Is it where only 50% of the population who are passing through can, can, can get coverage? And, you know, that, and that's up for interpretation. I, I don't know, maybe there is a, a formal definition now in, in some papers, some government um, areas, but... You know, a, not, a not spot is, you know, for me, it's somewhere where you know, a good proportion of the population, if they pass through there, they can't get the coverage. Um, so, you know, service providers don't like not spots. They don't like bad press, um, and that happens on a regular basis. They don't like the politics behind it. Um, every couple of years, we tend to see this debate rise again around national roaming and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's a reason why we don't have national roaming, and, and it's... it's it's to, to do with the issues that we talked about earlier around competition. You, you need to have a good, strong, competitive market and, and you, you need your competitors to be investing heavily and competing based on quality and service. And, and so, um, you know, having, having national roaming, in, unless you're very careful about how you design such a thing, um, could, could be problematic in that area. So, so there, there, are, there are a few of the challenges um, that at, at, the, at the highest level that the traditional service providers face on a, on a regular basis. Um, so we, we want to kind of turn that on its head, and we're trying to make the case to say, well, actually, yes, in cities, 
you design your tariffs, your, your, your mobile broadband tariffs, and you sell them gold, silver, bronze, etc., to the customers and, and, and people in the cities. But actually, if we can find the ways to automate and design out um, these kind of vertical use cases and, therefore, and the networks, if we can find a way to build out the networks in a much more economical manner, then we think there are plenty of use cases and there are plenty of revenue upsides in beyond the city itself, you know, whether that's rural industrial, whether that's agri-tech, um, farming, dairy farming, tourism, um, the list goes on. And, um, and you hear, you'll hear a lot more about that later on today as, as we go through some of them things. So put another way, um, you know, we've broken it down into a few areas here, like the radio itself, we're trying to take cost out of radios so that it makes the economics better for service providers. And we've got over 10 different radio products in this, in this project, nearly every one of them considers cost very strongly in terms of what they're doing and how they're building and how they're architecting their networks and their radio equipment and how they're innovating. So we want to drop the cost, we want to improve, increase the innovation. So there'll be you know, t techniques like a disaggregated and open VRAM, um, that's where you virtualize the radios themselves and you, you break them into component parts. You'll see outside in the demos there are, there are several um, radio vendors talking about that. On Spectrum itself, you know, we need to see some of the price points come out, or at least maybe um, managing and auctioning and, and selling Spectrum in maybe a slightly different way, such that it provides some opportunities for new, income, new, new players to, um, to enter the market. And again, we want to see the innovation go up in there, um, in, in the area of Spectrum and how you manage it. Um, we'll, be, we'll be hearing David talk about dynamic Spectrum access um, a little bit later. Then we look at the core and the transport, um, same thing, you know, I, I'm Cisco, I sell an awful lot of core and transport, but I, I recognise the fact that we do still need to take some of the cost out of, out of that too. Um, but again, we, we have to increase the innovation there, and a lot of that innovation will be around, you know, things like segment routing, where you can reuse the same transport for multiple different things, uh, managing costs for several different services all at once. Um, on the core, you know, how we can, can we slice that network so that it, it's got several different uses all at once, um, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. I could, I could talk about that for quite a long time, but 20 minutes is 20 minutes. And, we, and the same on the vertical industries, right? So we need to see uh, money. Um, we need to see a, a lot of the vertical industries that you'll hear talked about later by Stephen and by some of the panellists. You know, it's about taking, taking cost out of them in vertical industries um, and improving the innovation in, the, in there. And so... Um, in, in pretty much every sector, that's what we're trying to achieve. On the cost side itself, um, from a service provider's perspective at least, um, you know, here are some of the kind of key cost drivers. So we have things like site acquisition and rent. And I, I saw Donny, Donny here earlier who's done some of this stuff in the past. Um, and and we, we, we've understood and learned a lot of lessons about the different issues you have when you're trying to acquire and rent sites. Um, but, but, you know, in, in, a, in a place where there's no coverage or very, very little coverage, um, sometimes you find um, there's, there's altruism and there's, there's people who, who want to provide that service for the benefit of the community. Uh, but nevertheless, it's still a key cost driver. RAN equipment. Um, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of cost in RAN equipment, particularly if you look at the macro scale across, across a country. It's probably one of the biggest pots of money that a service provider has to, has to spend and therefore... It's where they focus a lot of effort. Um, so um, we, we at Cisco, um, we, we don't sell macro radio right now today. However, um, we, we, we're very keen to see that industry um, disrupted and changed and manipulated in a different way such that um, you can disaggregate all the functions of a radio, introduce new innovative players, and you're going to see a few of them out, out there today for sure. Um, backhaul is a key cost driver, obviously, and um, you'll see over the back of the demo, demo area um, some guys who are talking about Li-Fi, so that's using light as an alternative method of, of backhauling traffic from a radio back into the core of the network and onto the internet. Um, and, and again, there's a lot of innovation that can happen in and around backhaul, but it's a significant cost point, and you know, if, if the assumption is you need fibre, it's, um, it's very difficult to get that fibre into some very remote rural areas. Spectrum access and cost we've talked about already, and I think David will be talking about that some more. And then, of course, let's not forget operations. Um, it's all very easy for us, particularly in these projects, to go and install something, but then you've got to keep it running, and someone's got to be able to 
operate that in a very autonomous manner. So there's a lot of auto automation that needs to be brought into operations. And frankly, there's got to be some thinking around who really should be operating this. You know, do, do I want a community service provider to not only build a couple of radios, but also host the core, perform legal intercept, perform billing, perform customer services? You know, in some scenarios, that will be the right answer. But in others, frankly, maybe that's not the right answer. Maybe, maybe they need to provide the bit that's difficult for the service provider, and then maybe let a traditional service provider do the rest. So um, all, the, all these things are drivers. Um, and there's innovation that's happening that we're seeing in our project in around pretty much every space on this. And so what, what I found is a lot of the obstacles are also opportunities. So in this era of 5G, in this next decade, a lot of things are changing. There's an awful lot of um, cogs turning for service providers. Their hardware-based network is moving to a pure software-based network. That is not insignificant. That is a very difficult thing for a service provider to manage, manage through. It's a whole different skill set. We start here in terms like CICD, where you have constant innovation and constant movement of software, like, like a train coming through their network. Um, that, that's, that's difficult in itself for a service provider to consume, but they do see that there's a long-term benefit to do that, and so they're on that track. In and on, along with that, then we've got this concept of cloud computing now, so you, not only does your network not become a special hardware box anymore, but it can now sit anywhere. It can sit in your service provider private cloud. It can sit in a public cloud, and indeed Cisco have launched that and, and ran a few of our networks in public clouds. Um, and it, it can move on to the edge. So because it's now pure software, then the network is very fungible in actual fact, and it can kind of move around. And so now we can see the networks getting right to the edge. By edge, I mean closer to the end user or the IoT device. Um, <coughs> on top of that, there's a, there's a, in general, we've seen a lot of disaggregation of functionality. So you had the big monolithic box. Now we've broken that into software. Now we've looked at that software and we've said, let's break every component of that software where it makes sense into smaller lumps of software or microservices, as we call them, um, and, and see if we can redesign the entire network in a very different way, again, based on this disaggregation. That's happened in the core. It's now happening in the radio, and it's going to make a really significant change over time, we think, in, in terms of how networks are built and operated. We've talked about backhauling before. so. Um, I'll, t I'll talk about three, very briefly, three terms. We have not spot roaming. Uh, this, is, um, this is the method of, instead of having national roaming, we say, let's identify some very specific areas, like, for example, certain parts of Orkney, and say, OK, that, that's what the, is formally defined as a not spot. And so when you go there, you can, service providers can roam on, onto each other's networks. Uh, there's neutral hosting, which um, is kind of linked, but it's essentially where you have a radio that radio is emitting the, um, the names of all of the operators. So that uh, instead of having four, rep, four radios or two radios for the four operators, or the four main operators here in the UK, um, you can have one radio owned, operated and controlled at low cost, but actually emitting the, um, the spectrum or, or some spectrum uh, for, all, for the, all four operators, Vodafone, BT, or, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, dynamic spectrum management, uh, we've talked about before. You'll hear about that a little bit more. So it's all very painful. It's all very challenging. Um, but actually, there are, they are all opportunities. Now, um, I used to work as a, a management consultant out in India um, a few years ago. And um, I had the uh, fortune, or misfortune, to work for a chap called Tariq Amin. Uh, he's the CTO of Reliance Geo at the time. He's now moved over to uh, Rakuten in Japan. Um, he's had a very so he's been a very lucky chap in a way. He's one of the very few people in the world who's got to build two greenfield networks so right from the from from bottom up. So let's talk about this one in Japan. So what he's done there, he's he's built an entirely disaggregated network. So every single function, right from the every cell, right the way through to the very core of his network, it's all software. Um, he is placed. He's broken the radio down into all of its component parts and he shifts them parts along and he moves them into different parts of his data center. And he has three types of data centers. He has, he has, a, he has a very, very small, cheap cell site, which has pretty much no technology on it at all other than that antenna. He's then got this thing called the far edge data center and we have edge data centers and then we have the central data center. The, 
These things um, managed and cost managed and designed to cost at the most finite, finite um, level of detail to make sure that this case works. And if you do it right, um, Tarek's statement would be that he thinks he's received, he's engineered in a 35% improvement in total cost of ownership. So, so yes, we can see all of these issues of disaggregation and hardware moving to software and, and, and changes in backhaul. Um, if you embrace it and you innovate on top of it, then we see actually it can actually provide a benefit and it's actually an innovation opportunity. One other I'd like to call out um, is specifically around the, um, the Shropshire use case. We have a use case in Shropshire. I won't go into the detail because I think um, Stephen will talk about it a little bit more later, but essentially there's a, it's a low latency um, use case. So not only does it need quite a high upload speed um, for connection between these drones and tractors, it's, fully, it's, it's an autonomous tractor use case from Precision Decisions. Not only does it need low latency and, and high bandwidth, um, it, also, it, it needs us to kind of move, because of the state of the radios, it, it's, it's required us to move the user plane, which is a core part of the mobile <coughs> network, right onto the farm. Now, that was not easy to do. Um, you would have thought it would be. I thought it would be. Um, I've managed product development teams for most of my career, and I just think everything's easy, and then let someone else deal with the problems. This was difficult to do. It took us at least four months of elapsed time. It probably took us well over four months of man hours to design a network where we can have the kind of routing working properly between a drone and a tractor and what we call the mission control system, which is the management platform. Um, a long time, there's a lot of people in this room now who, who are feeling the pain as we're even speaking about it, Malik, for example. Um, as I look at that, that, there is no fundamental reason why that would not be able to be done in one week's elapsed time and 30 minutes of, of, of man hour work if you built all of the automation um, in and around it. Because if you don't do that, that use case will never become real. It will never get out of a test bed into a real world. You've got to, we've got to fix them problems. We've got to fix them for the operators, as well as fix them for maybe any other new, new, new type of business that wants to start up. And so when we look at these types of things, we look at, um, we look at the enterprise of the vertical industry, and we look at the service provider themselves, and we say, well, actually, we've got to automate both. We've got to automate everything the service provider had to do to make that happen. And we have to automate anything that the industry provider would need to do to make that happen. And, and in Cisco parlance, we, um, you know, we have two different parts of our business. We have enterprise business and service provider business. What we're doing now is we're building APIs between both, them, both the technology and both of them parts of the business. The part of the business where service providers express their intent is where they express their policy, define quas, define security and segmentation for their customers. And then we do exactly the same thing with this thing called the DNA Center, which is um, a product that we sell in, the, in our enterprise sector. That's where um, enterprise IT managers define things like security, expression of intent, quality of service, etc. We link them both together so that when an enterprise, when a service provider says, I want to do something, he presses the button, does the things that he cares about. Then when the enterprise sector side of the business says he wants to do something, he presses a few buttons, and then things work together. So that expression of intent moves from a traditional enterprise network, such as um, Harper Adams um, LAN that, 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 that they built down there, right the way through to the service provider network. Um, and so that, that's part of the portfolio of things that, that we're seeing coming together that's really going to bring the cost down and bring, bring the simplicity that's really needed to make some of these use cases fly. So um, I think I'm about done. In, in conclusion, I think I'd just like to say, uh, you know, nearly all of the challenges we face are actually op opportunities for innovation, um, whether it's... Um, trying to use fixed wireless access radios on, on a ferry on some of the roughest seas um, around this, this United Kingdom of ours, or whether it's putting kind of parallel wireless radios up on these masts in, in these really extreme conditions in Orkney, whether it's uh, the lighthouse use case, which is um, beaming um, kind of backhaul to these houses from what you can see there in the middle. Um, I think there's a little village there. It's so small you can't even see it, but that is a very unconnected village right there, and, um, and that lighthouse is providing a backhaul connection for internet um, for them. 
So we've got all of these crazy use cases and um, the innovation is there and uh, we want to carry on doing it. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>